Um, I'm actually deviating a little bit from what's in the program. Uh, the program will say collaborative editing in Drupal Core. It was a presentation that I gave at DrupalCon in Portland. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. It is available. Uh, and that was about, hey, all this open source technology is available to us. We could put it into Drupal Core if we chose to. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. We're really going to talk about what we built, why it's interesting, and what it might do for you. And we're going to start with some project management stuff. I don't know why we even did it. Uh, let's give you the background. Add it together. It's an open source, multi user, field level, peer to peer, real time collaboration framework built for Drupal using open source and open standards. There's a lot to unpack in that sentence, and we will get back to it as we go through. Um, <clears throat> features. One of the interesting things when you see the demo, which I'm going to give you in a minute. You're going to be like, oh, look, it's, it's a rich text editor, it's Google Docs. Well, yes, and. Uh, so it has an extensible plugin for the rich text editor. Spoiler alert, it's not CK editor. Uh, threaded commenting and suggestions, auto save and change tracking. And we've got, we're going to run the cost of media library adoption core with support for the media library and entity browser. Um, we integrate with Drupal content moderation. Um, workspaces and those things. Uh, we integrate with existing access control mechanisms and SSO. So that's all good. Uh, I am going to give you a demo. This is where I have to switch applications. This is a silent demo. I'll set it up a little bit. And I'm going to try to do one of these live on Thursday afternoon. So that'll be fun. On the left is user A, on the right is user B. And what you'll notice is that each window is tracking what the other person is doing. Uh, and so when we say this is multi-field, we're actually going to start by editing the title of this node. Uh, the person on the left is doing the editing, and the person on the right is just sort of being moved around and following around. Uh, again, really interesting, really powerful. Uh, here, they're, you know, they're editing the revision comment. Uh, and then someone can go in and add a threaded comment to the right-hand sidebar. Uh, this is all happening in real time, uh, in a secure fashion, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, and we'll talk about that. And over on the right, threaded commenting, like you would see in a Google Doc or a Office 365 document. Uh, and you can resolve those comments the same way you would uh, in those applications. So, that's the sort of basic, very quick two-minute introduction to what we're talking about. The question is why and what might you want to do with it? And how does it fit in, more importantly, to a federal tech stack? So I'm going to talk as quickly as I can about where it came from, how it works, what the security implications are, um, and then what it actually means for Drupal and what we're planning to do next. Um, I did not mention I work for Palantir.net. I need to stress that .net is we're near DC. Uh, we're a web development and design firm based out of Chicago. Uh, and we've been doing Drupal, gosh, I've been doing Drupal for 20 years. Uh, Palantir's been doing it for 16. So um, where did this come from? Uh, we've been working with a state agency, um, particularly working with Medicaid applications. By the way, side note, my aunt's Medicaid application was approved this morning, correct? So, that's a little off my mind. Um, <clears throat> so, they're actually building state level Medicaid services documentation uh, to help people get the services they need. The team members have to draft, edit, approve, and publish content for benefit of all this other stuff. And their current workflow will probably look familiar to many of you. Uh, if not the tools, the complexity. They, they start off drafting in Microsoft Word, and they copy that over into, wow. See, I forgot the name of the thing. The RH thing. Robo. Robo, which I believe is an Adobe product for generating automated PDFs. It's a very weird thing, and even weirder, they have something like four different versions of it because it's hard to get updates that run on different 
machines and they, they can't do, like, they can't upgrade a RoboHop, RoboHop 3 document to RoboHop 4, so they're stuck with different versions. Um, once they get out of RoboHop, they, they push it to PDF and then upload it via FTP, their web server, where they email it to people, um, and they track all of this in a SharePoint. So they're using literally like five different tools to track critical content. Um, that strikes us as, as rather wasteful. Their, their content life cycle goes even further back than that because they start with a conversation on the far left with their subject matter experts about what needs to go in this document, what regulations we have to hit, who are our target audiences, etc., etc. So it moves through this very complex process. Uh, and they're producing, like I said, four different user guides, five handbooks. Uh, and four manuals. And those are all for different audiences around the same topics. Um, this workflow leads to a lot of shortcut taking as much as people can. You know, you sort of adapt to the system you have. Um, people know what the limitations of the current system are, and they work around it as best they can. But it is very, very wasteful. If any of you were at the keynote um, before lunch, and if you missed it, you should go watch it on YouTube because it was fascinating. Um, there's a lot of time wasted in our process, a lot of waiting for things to happen. There's also, and this is a big deal I think for government, um, there's no single audit trail. There's just a series of handoffs from system to system to system, from person to person to person. So these all really bother. There's a lot of friction and inefficiency. There's a lot of places where they can make mistakes. Uh, there's a lot of places where the, the amount of effort they're putting in doesn't actually pay off for the citizens, right? A lot of ways to work. Um, and it's very difficult for them to grow into that. If they needed to make a new publication in this workflow, they would not be very happy about it. So, <clears throat> again, going back to the keynote, what was the outcome they're looking for? It would tell us how. What's the outcome? Create, manage, and publish in one place. And their, like many of you, their allowed and mandated system is Drupal. They have a Drupal 10 website, they use it. Uh, and so the question becomes how can we make it so that entire workflow can move into Drupal? Um, so these are the requirements move the existing workflow into Drupal 10, uh, including their approval processes, the audit trail. Uh, find a solution for collaborative real-time editing so they can remove Office 365 from the stack. Um, have a text editor that has comments and suggestions. Um, and then security considerations, like many government agencies, even though this is state and not federal, uh, they can't post things overseas, right? They can't interact with certain pieces of technology that originate in certain countries. Uh, so there are also some FedRAMP compliance pieces. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. Data sovereignty, the idea that it's my data, nobody else should ever see it or touch it. Um, elimination of man in the middle attacks. We'll get to that. Um, and this was the, the last piece. The application you're going to see, the demo you're going to see, is not a SaaS hosted enterprise. It really just relies on one tiny piece of software you can host wherever you want in whatever compliant system you have. So in our case, the, the division, the same division we are working with already had an Azure cloud server, and we just stood part of the application up on the map. I'll talk about what that's about. But <clears throat> think about that for a second. It's a FedRAMP compliant, single source collaborative editing tool that tracks all of your stuff. Okay, that's cool. So we did a lot of exploration. There's a big team involved, a big shout out to everybody involved. Um, we looked at how we get these requirements. Most of the workflow requirements were already satisfied. Collaborative editing, audit trails, and security eliminated the other two big things that we were looking at. Office 365 um, didn't actually have the audit trail as a publication of thinking. Um, and CK Editor 5, a little side note, <clears throat> if, you, if you've explored it, CK Editor 5, lovely product, has collaborative editing as a paid service. 
It is totally insecure not to be trusted by anyone who wants better and compliance, so we will talk about why. Uh, insecure. It is not compliant with federal standards. Whether or not it's secure is a different question. It's also hosted in Europe, so pretty much all of the two. Add it together. What does it actually do? What's it doing behind the scenes? Um, we're using a combination of two things. Prose Mirror, which is a rich text editor. How many of you use Jira? You use Prose Mirror. Congratulations. Um, Prose Mirror is very, very widely adopted. Uh, YJS is a framework for real-time collaboration and data storage. It literally creates an object to track the state of the thing you're editing. And those two things have libraries that talk to one another, the maintainers of the two teams talk to one another, which is great. And then we do collaboration over <coughs> excuse me, a technology called WebRTC, uh, which is just a web real-time collaboration, which is a browser framework, uh, a browser support. WebRTC just says, browser A would like to talk to browser B. And they make a handshake introduction and then get out of the way. It's an entirely peer-to-peer -peer connection. Uh, we'll talk about why that's more secure than the And then, as I mentioned, data sovereignty, uh, data sovereignty, the idea that your data is never going to leave your hosting environment. Uh, and the community of Act, again, we're, we're giving you know, configurable real time collaboration. There's lots of things you can turn on and off. Um, there's open source extensibility, uh, and then there's this framework for collaboration. So, um, it's important to know that while it ships with a rich text editor, that's not the actual product. The actual product is a collaboration framework that surprises us a little bit when we figure this out, that can plug into any form element. And we'll let that sink in for a minute. That, that's how we could edit titles in tandem. For those of you who are Drupal front end or, or Drupal uh, architect, we can collaborate, collaboratively edit a view or site settings. I, I, I see one of my old, old friends in the back, he's just, his brain is furrowed. He's, he's like, why would I do that? Training maybe? Or, or because you can. I think, I it, the point is, it's not our job to dictate use cases to you, right? So, but it, it's this collaboration thing. Uh, so yeah. Fully featured a word processor that's part of it and all the other stuff. And for developers, there's a plugin system for like adding new features. So that's what that is. Um, technology. Okay. Drupal and the text editor API. And this is actually pretty simple. Drupal um, <coughs> Core only supports C Editor 5, but does have a module that other things can theoretically plug into. Uh, it's a little trickier than it should be, but it, it does work. So we just plug into that uh, and are able to install our own uh, text editor. Again, Prosmir, which is a frame, Prosmir is weird. It is itself not a rich text editor. It's a framework for building them. Uh, so it covers the default implementation of it, uh, but you can add whatever crazy buttons you want. Like I just learned today what button I need to add to my feature, which is called language of part which indicates that a part of your text is in a different language than the declared text of the main page. I learned that in the accessibility section as well. Um, so we can instantiate this sort of configurable text editor thing, which is really nice. And then you know, YJS <clears throat> literally is an abstract data storage model for the document object. So YJS knows what has changed about that document. Um, and that's a single of those things. So what's actually happening behind the scenes is that YJS is tracking those changes. And WebRTC is then saying, hey, Bob, Carol just made an edit to this page. You might want to go fetch those changes. It doesn't actually push the changes from Bob to Carol. It just pushes the notification, which is what makes it more secure. Because none of your data is going across that request. So why? Um, Prosmere is a flexible editor instance. Um, big fans. YJS, again, industry-leading uh, 
piece. So I'm going to be getting to that. So <clears throat> and we go from this concept of, hey, we can edit this body feel at the same time to, as I showed very briefly in the demo, we can edit anything on this page at the same time. So let's talk about that. So what are the barriers for doing this? What does it take to actually implement? <clears throat> Collaboration. So this is why CK under five doesn't work for government. Uh, they are using a client approach model, which simply means, hey, you can you can pay for their service, which has collaborative editing baked into it, and every time you make a change, that change gets pushed up to their cloud, to their cloud, and then pushed back down to everybody else who's connected to it. Um, it's very reliable. Um, it's very very common. It, it's used all over the place. Um, but your content state is exposed to and managed by a third-party service. Right? That's not acceptable for most government use cases. Um, and then cost, the hosting costs are quite significant. There are often um, per seat license fees on top of it. We're not big fans of such things, personally. Um, collaboration via WebRTC, again, it's a, peer, it's a reliable peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, it's actually a sort of core backbone technology built into to web browsing. Um, it's how you make video calls and use instant messaging services. All those kinds of peer to peer communications that happen seamlessly all over the web all the time. Um, <clears throat> the content state stays within the application that started. Right? So we're not sending that content to a third party. Uh, and then the cost, the hosting costs are significantly lower. Uh, than client server models. You, if you're on a host that charges you per request, you're going to see a, a request spike because the application is going to be making more requests to the back end. Uh, and the RTC server we're talking about um, requires something called a signaling server, which I believe, no, I'll get to it. Sorry. This is the part that my colleague was supposed to do. Then he got COVID. <clears throat> so we talked about uh, these pieces. Plugins, uh, you can write plugins for granular control over all the things. If there's a button that you need that isn't provided, you can write one. Like, so we have subscript and superscript and emphasis and list and order of things, unordered things, link. But if you need, like I just said, like the language per language by part, you can write that. You don't need us to do it. Um, you can add new features. Uh, right now, the commenting system doesn't send emails, but you can write that in three days if you knew what you were doing, because the tools are already present. Um, and yeah, four element bindings for whatever you want to collaborate So that's good stuff. Um, <clears throat> one of the pieces I think I've alluded to a couple of times, but I should get into. Uh, Autosaving is there by default. We, we went through a lot of engineering for head scratching on this one. Uh, Drupal has the concept of what's called a forward revision, which means an unpublished revision that doesn't upset the published version. <coughs> this was actually a revolutionary concept when we wrote it in Drupal why JS documents that object that stores all the information about changes uh, get attached to uh, a forward revision automatically? And there's an auto save that you can configure uh, to do as frequently as you like. Every 10 seconds, every 10 minutes, up to you. Uh, and those why JS documents have all the granular changes that got made during their lifespan. Then once you hit the save button, they kind of get quashed. Uh, so they get rolled up into an actual Drupal revision. Uh, but there's nothing stopping us from keeping those as audit trail for if we want to. Uh, I will point out, I got a note from the developer this morning, from the lead developer, who said, when I checked with the YJS developer, and data storage is not a 
problem. Uh, for this, if you're thinking about is this going to get out of control? No, it's it's not. It's marginal. So that's good news. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Four element bindings again, real technical piece. Uh, just like the editor APIs or even the four API in Drupal, the YJS can use a JavaScript behavior to bind to any formula. What does that mean? It means you can develop applications that we haven't even thought of, giving you control of the, the, the collaboration of the element, which is really kind of fascinating. It also means that if you're tracking some of the initiatives like Google's Starshot, where they want to use more interactive content building techniques, we can plug into that now because we can bind straight to those formulas. So we can do collaborative editing in a visual editor rather than a form-based editor, which is actually really exciting. And then this is the piece I was just alluding to, the WebRTC infrastructure. So <clears throat> how many of you were old enough to remember when Pub Sub Hubbub was a thing? And you can't see I'm raising my head to Pub Sub Hubbub was just a system for connecting peers, uh, basically. It did a bunch of other stuff, too. But WebRTC is interesting. It's a default technology that no one provides support for uh, for free anymore. Uh, YJS actually has a default server that you can use for development purposes. Um, the only thing this does, the only thing that it does is say, hey, Bob and Carol are both using you know, VA.gov and trying to edit node three, would you like to connect them? That's literally all that, it, all that it does. It doesn't even know who Rob and Carol are. It doesn't know if they're logged in or not. Their login group is separate from this. This is really just a handshake server that says, hey, person A and person B, and we tested this with up to two dozen people before the connection got a little wobbly. So if you want it, 20 people in a document, you could. Uh, with PowerPoint web hosting, you could get hired. Too. So, by default, there's a, a single link server package with YJS that you can use for testing. Uh, if you're just on your mobile laptop, you can just use native web RTC and work fine. Uh, our client's using Azure because it's already in their tech stack, it's already approved. Uh, Azure actually has this technology, it's pretty much off the shelf code. Uh, and there's a couple of others that I don't know anything about, actually. Meter.ca, the Canadians are and Twilio, and uh, there was work. But the point is, <clears throat> to make this work, yes, you need a Drupal site, and you're going to need a Drupal module, and you are going to need this signaling server. Uh, and if you come to the technical demo on Thursday, I'll talk about one of the couple of the things that it's doing. Uh, the good news, spoiler alert, the good news is it works fine if you're on a VPN. Because so, we solved that problem too. Actually, we discovered that other people had solved it. Like that. So, um, and then again, I, I think I've said this several times, but I really want to hear it Data Sovereignty, WebRTC, doesn't send your content to anyone else. Right. That infrastructure that supports collaboration. You can host to whatever data center you want. The first time we did this presentation in Portland, and somebody immediately came up and was like, can I host this in California? And I'm like, yeah, you, you can host it wherever you want to, right? You can put it in, in a laptop in a closet for all we care. We're not, that's not the business that we're in. Right? So, um, it offers a collaboration model for the security conscious or security required organizations uh, when you can't use client server. So that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We talk a little bit about what's coming down the pipeline, what it means for developers, for content editors, for Drupal, and I get a little bit to the question when can I actually use it? When can I get my hands on it? Um, and for developers, it's a plugin architecture. We have a sample module that shows you how all these things are done. We have a default module that enables all the default buttons and things. Uh, but you can do rapid iteration of future development. Uh, it's a very low 
barrier to entry. Um, I'm not going to say mean things about other people's JavaScript. Uh, I do too. Uh, anyway, the, the name is collaboration to be expanded to other formats. So I can very easily see someone writing, like an edit together views module that allows this kind of collaboration across the views you want. Um, for content editors, I mean, there's a really interesting split in this presentation because there's a lot of technical background, but I don't want to lose sight of this part. Real-time, single source, collaboration, and revision history. I got my start in this business working in newspapers, and I, I worked in newsrooms for five years, and every time I go and start a new project, I always ask the client, where does first right through happen? Which means where do you draft your ideas? Where do you start? And if you if we go back to the early slides where we talk about our state agency, it's nowhere near Drupal. Drupal is an afterthought at the end of their current production life cycle. They're not thinking web first. Heck, they're producing PDFs for crying out loud. If you need this kind of single source revision tracking with collaboration, you do not have really good options. We can give you that option now. Right. So first write through can happen in the CMS because the tooling you need is baked into the CMS. That's huge for you. So we can have creation of workflows and processes based on that collaboration. Uh, and it eliminates that need to develop content outside of Google and eliminates all those handoffs and places where mistakes can be made. Uh, so, I'm excited about that. I will point out too, <coughs> excuse me, they have a sort of non moderation workflow uh, where typically if you're using content moderation in Google, uh, certain people can approve things and move them from state to state through the, through the workflow. Uh, they didn't, this group didn't like that because they said, well, what if Carol goes on vacation? They wanted to be able to delegate their approvers, their, their content approval approvals uh, on the fly. So I wrote a module for that. You can go get that's all workbench approvers. It's out. Workbench approver locks the moderation state until someone says yes. And you can just literally ad hoc say either Bob or Carol has to sign off on this before it moves out of legal review. Uh, and it works seamlessly. It's really, really nice. That's why I changed the plug for that. Uh, for Drupal, again, we're talking about could this go in court? It certainly could. And we're having conversations with Dries about this, largely because, in full disclosure, the co-owner of Palantir is on the Drupal Association Board. Right, so we're having constant conversations about how does this fit into Starship? Where does it go? The future of Drupal. If you think about it, if it were a core feature of Drupal 12, how valuable is that? We're also interested in actually having an open source option for the text editor. Uh, CD editor, as nice as it is, is not an open source project. They allow us to use it in an open source project, but it's not. It's so important. Um, and yet, we would be the first CMS to bake in this sort of real time collaboration natively. So, uh, what types of those of you would like to take photos? We do have a landing page. They just wrote, they just published yesterday. Um, and there's a form, so it's a little bit. What's the word? Um, it's a little tricky to talk about what's next. There is no release you can go download and start playing. Part of that is because the documentation is not ready. Like the documentation for how to stand up the signaling server. The documentation for how to debug things. That's part of it. Part of it too. Also, if you've ever released open source software, you'll know what support can look like. And I can guarantee as soon as we open this up, we're going to get a flood of support requests for Crossbearer. 
and the text editor, which we're not prepared to deal with. That's an unfortunate fact. Uh, so we actually have to do a little bit more R&D around the use cases of things um, and make sure that if we put it in front of your development team, they can stand it up without our help. That's an interesting thing for me to say too. Speaking as a member of a Drupal agency, who's a sponsor of this conference, we would prefer it if you didn't have to hire us to use this. Yeah, I said that out loud. It's very, very strange, but it's the truth. So we are right now very focused on getting it correct and making it sustainable. So we are open to partners uh, to join the private pair. We are still trying to get something out. I know at this point it would be after Drupalcon Barcelona. Uh, we're in the middle, actually in the middle of a sprint for all of August where we have been working on all this documentation and other things. Um, the other part that's next, again, Thursday at 2 uh, in the Debug Academy room, I'm going to try to do a demo. I'm going to actually log in two browsers on my own laptop and get it running. Uh, that'll be fun because I've never done a demo. And the guy who had it just here. Um, <clears throat> Look at that, we finished very much on time. That's only 32 minutes. I have plenty of time for Q&A. Or you can just go about your day. Or I can go back to the demo. I can do all kinds of things. I will, I think, come up to the front now. Now that I'm not bound to my computer. And everybody, this is what I look like. <laughs> Matthew, do you have a question? Yeah. Page, the landing page for this? Is the page yeah, let me go back to the landing page for us. I, I just said I wouldn't have to be in the back anymore. I do. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Edit together for the program. I can drop that in Slack. I should have dropped it in Slack before, the GovCon Slack. Oh, okay. I would drop it in GovCon Slack as a shameless plug. The one that's at, that's just that slash edit together is a paid private beta. Does it say paid? It says paid beta. No. No. Okay. Well, I didn't write that page. <laughs> I was just curious about that one. Like, what are you paying? We pay. At the very least, you probably have to pay for the signal next year. The signal, okay. Sure. Very likely. Hey. We're probably actively looking for project sponsors. I mean, the, the, again, the interesting point. I said we're not looking to profit off of it. A state government just put a significant amount of R and D money into this, and then their budget ran out, and their contract ran out. So now it's like, okay, who can get this in the next part of it? So I, I apologize if I'm off message on that. Yeah. Well, it's a big room, maybe you can hear me. Can you speak a little bit more about why JS saves and revisions in the Google CMS? Are you talking about every time you type a letter, you get a new revision? Okay, so the question was, how does YJS handle, re handle revisions um, in the Drupal CMS? Understand that Drupal has its own revision system, so when you save a node, you get a new version of that node. The YJS internal revision system is separate from that and has its own data storage. Uh, so we are not real time. If you're real time collaborating with us, we're not going to create 800 revisions of the node. We're going to create one revision of the node that has 800 YJS revisions. And then I, I think I said, I, I believe when you actually do save it, it washes that in a very Git-like way. Be like, yeah, we're just going to roll that up into one thing. Uh, but we don't have to throw away the YJS record if we don't want to. I think we are right now, but we don't have to. So you could have that record, or you could tie into that record and be like, oh, we're about to save this node. We know that these four people collaborated on it. Let's have a field that stores that. But no, it's not overloading your database with 
So the, the concern was, are we going to get overloaded with too many revisions? And the answer is no. Yeah. I have a similar question in that you mentioned about having a central server. And I know a lot of systems do that so that they can offload the uh, database rights to some other system. And uh, also it provides a place where if an editor has a bad internet connection or closes their laptop, you're not breaking the same for all the other users who are looking at the same time. So if I understand it right, you're basically using Drupal to store that temporary data until it gets finalized into a piece of content. And I'm curious, like, do you find on the site you put on that you have to put a little more thought into servers resourcing the databases and so on to make sure that they can keep up with all those key servers? Okay, that was a very complicated question with people here. I can try to summarize it, or I can let you just speak into the microphone. Uh, I should have done this the first time. So, uh, you mentioned that you don't have a central server, and a lot of other systems do have a central server so that you can offload database rights from your main CMS for the actual editing process because you still need to store the, the temporary data and to handle what happens with and then they're closing their laptop or having a bad internet connection or what have you. And I was wondering if when you actually deploy this for your Drupal sites, if you need to put a little bit more budget or focus into making sure that, uh, you know, if you're posted, let's say, on Pantheon or Aquia or whatever, that your database isn't going to fall over and have an outage. Thank you for repeating all that for the recording. Um, that is something that we need to test more. That's one of the reasons we're still in a sort of closed beta. We haven't had that problem in practice. Um, with, uh, it's on Aquio right now. Uh, the database rights are pretty seamless. They happen asynchronously from the JavaScript layer. So it's not really a big deal as far as we know. Uh, it, it does sort of jack up uh, Aquio's uh, request limits because it is making some round trip requests to get new data. Uh, one of the things that's baked into the architecture to solve that is the auto save condition, which I think defaults to every 10 seconds, but you can it's, you can set it to a minute, you can set it to whatever. It would be really fascinating to test you know, what happens for someone who's trying to do this remotely. Right, you're out in the field with spotty Wi Fi. What would that do? And I don't think I have a good answer to that question. Yeah. So, related question then does this mean you could use it with a decoupled edit admin UI? <clears throat> does this mean you could use it with a decoupled edit admin UI? I think the answer is certainly yes. I don't see why you couldn't. Because it's binding to the form, it doesn't care about the other parts of it. Right? So, yeah, you, if you were doing you know, decoupled presentation, you certainly, you certainly could. Uh, I don't see any reason why. And that's one of those great sort of use cases. Yeah? So, since this replaces Seagatter and Newsweek Fields, is it uh, working on any work with Paris or Make it. Support requests I'm worried about. Okay. The question was since it's, since you would have to replace CK with Pros Mirror, how do you replicate all the functionality? The answer is you do it one piece at a time based on need, based on importance. Um, ironically, the site that is using this right now is using both. Um, partially because there's not a clean conversion between the two formats. CK Editor has its own internal markup spec that it uses, and Prosmer has its own, and so converting from the one to the other could be painful. Um, it's going to happen. So. Um, but yeah, what if, if you want to add something like Linkit, that's why we have an open model. It's like, here's the code you would need to write to make that happen. And we have plenty of examples of that. We don't have 
full feature parity. We're not trying to have full feature parity right now. Uh, but we have most of everything you're going to need. And it would just be a case of, yeah, what's most important? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think at the moment we're hitting everything that's in core. You can do links. You can do, you know, all this general formatting I mentioned briefly. We have support for both entity browser and media library because as, if, you, if you're not familiar, as you move into the Drupal 10 space, now that media library is in core, we should stop using entity browser and use what's in core. I get in trouble sometimes when I say that. Like, no, it's, I get somebody mad. So I'm the product manager for workbench moderation, which is the precursor to content moderation. And I got people yelling at me in the issue queue when I told them that they should stop using workbench moderation in Drupal 9. Mm -hmm. I'm like, look, I am the product manager. I'm telling you not to use it. We are not going to support it. And, and people were coming at me like, but it's not as full featured as, you know, content moderation is not as full featured. And I'm like, support and stability are features. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and then we get out of here. I love this question, but I don't know the answer. So the question from a content editor and accessibility content strategist and accessibility person. So we want accessible content. We have things like the Hemingway editor plugin and other ally plugins. How do they work in real time? The answer is they should just work the way they normally do, but I don't know because we've never tested it. But I agree. We should definitely put that on the road map. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It depends on how those things are implemented, yeah. primarily. Uh, but if it's just reading the block of text that's in a, uh, a text area, it shouldn't interfere with it in any way. <clears throat> right. You'd have to rewrite them. You'd have to re-register re them with prose Yeah. Uh, but those might potentially introduce that third-party service problem, too. Uh, side note, maybe I'll stop the presentation and give you a side note. Now I'll tell you. Uh, all right, dirty little secret time. I was at another camp recently. I was at Triple Camp. I'm sorry, I just backed into the room. I was at Triple Camp Asheville, and I ran into a government security researcher who was horrified to discover that CK Editor's spell checker also sends your data to the cloud. In Ukraine. <clears throat> so he was in the process of trying to figure out how to rip, rip that out of 100 websites without pissing off his entire editorial staff because it was declared insecure. So, yeah, fun stuff. Um, I will be here around all week. Again, we're going to do a, a sort of more, more technical QA on Thursday. I very much appreciate your time and your attention and your very good questions. Thank you.